and it recruits the code proteins, those sex proteins that we talked we showed earlier. Once the code proteins are recruited, the whole thing evaginates. Eventually, it pinches off and forms a vesicle. I guess I didn't draw it small enough, but anyway. A coated, a coxin coated vesicle. And then that vesicle will go to the Cystology network. We'll talk about that in a minute. So let's consider what is going to make, how do proteins get in here? Well, once they're released from the protein synthesis machinery, the folding machinery, either membrane proteins or content <coughs> proteins are released, they can make their way over into this pathway. So if it's a membrane protein, for example, it can, you know, just diffuse in the membrane and come over here and get in. Now that is that does occur. And if it's a soluble protein, of course, it can make its way in also. So those things do happen, but that's relatively inefficient, and we know now that there's a whole system of receptors that actually mediate much of this process and bring proteins in. So there are transmembrane proteins that bind to content proteins and take them into the vesicle. They help concentrate them there. How does that work? Well, it works the same way as it works for regular membrane proteins. They don't just diffuse in either. Most, many of them have signals in their cytoplasmic tails. These are often acidic signals, but they can be others. And those signals, such as um, with acidic amino acids, there are various ones, can, in the cytoplasmic tail, can directly interact with the subunits of the COP2 coat. And because they can directly interact with the subunits, they can be clustered there. So that's true of membrane proteins that are just being transported out of the cell, which I meant to bring one more, and I didn't, meant to be, be transported out of the cell. But it's also true of proteins that are receptor proteins that bind to content-soluble proteins and take them into the coated vesicle. Now, some of those soluble proteins and some of those receptors are known. Most of them are still under study. And one of them is called ERGIC53. That actually binds to sugar residues on a number of different proteins, two of which are factors 5 and 8. And you know what factors 5 and 8 are because you did the blood clotting online one, right? You did that already? The coagulation factors. And we know that there are people who have mild hemophilia who have mutations in this protein, so it doesn't work very well. And factors 5 and 8 then don't get secreted very well, so they have relative, they're not completely, they're not bleeding all over the place, but they have a, a deficiency in factors 5 and 8 because they are missing the ERG IC53, which doesn't only bind to this, it binds to a number of other things too. So this is a receptor protein that clusters in COP2 vesicles and carries cargo out into the COP2 vesicle. Okay, so now, once we form the vesicle, of course, we have this cargo within it, and we have the membrane proteins within it, too. And they could either be mediated by, they could be mediated by, um, Receptors, or it could diffuse in. What has to happen next, I'll just take this out of the way because it's in the way, is this vesicle has to fuse with the cis Golgi network. And we'll talk about the mechanisms of fusion a little later on. But one thing that happens, of course, before that happens, the GTPase activity of the SAR1 starts to work, and the SAR1 GTP is created, is converted to GDP. That causes the coat to fall off, and after the coat falls off, this can undergo fusion. Now, once it gets here, of course, if there is cargo, such as factors 5 and 8, that have to be released, they have to be released from their trans 
know that the pH in the cis Golgi network is a little bit below the pH in the ER. So some of these receptors might work through pH. The calcium levels are a little bit below those in the ER. Calcium in the cis Golgi network. So it's thought that changes in ionic composition are what lead to the release of the cargo from its receptors. All right, and of course, if you're a membrane protein, I should have taken one of my membrane proteins. Oh, fuck. If you're a membrane protein, and you've been transported out as well, you're going to also be here, and you can be transported further down the secretory valve. All right, now the next problem we have is that we have all these receptors arriving here at the Cisgolgi network. And we need them to work again. We don't want to waste receptors that we only work once. Sometimes that's the way it works. There are some receptors that, like for Wnt, one of the growth factors, they really only work once and then they're kind of destroyed. They're not, they don't recycle all that well. But this one, the ERG53, does recycle. How does it recycle? It gets into another vesicle which emerges from this compartment called a COP1 vesicle. It gets into that COP1 vesicle because it has a signal in the cytoplasmic tail, another one, besides the adiacitic residues. It has basic residues. Again, there's a variety of different ones. It has some of the basic amino acids in it. And that allows it to interact with a different code called COP1. COP1 is formed on the membrane when a protein called ARF1 is converted from the GTP band, GDP band to the GTP band form. It's a relative of SAR1. And it binds here, and then it recruits the code subunits, which can, to some extent, interact with the membrane protein just like it was over here, and form a COP1 vesicle by similar means to what you saw before. So let's put our COP1 vesicle here. Okay, so we form the COP1 vesicle. It's got the receptors coming back in it, right? And then it's going to go back and fuse with the endoplasmic particular. And of course, before it fuses, the ARF1 hydrolyzes the GTP to GDP, and that causes the coat to fall off. And after the coat falls off, the vesicle can fuse, and the receptors can come back for another round. Okay? So that's relatively straightforward, yes? Sorry, is the R1 when it's active in GTP? GTP is active. Right, the same as the star one. Okay, so that's the cycle. Now, the cell is not perfect. It makes some mistakes. For example, what would happen sometimes, I mean, here's the question. Let me pose a question. You have proteins that have to stay in the endoplasmic particular. You've got DIP, you've got calnexin, you've got the oligosaccharide transferase, you've got the channel. How do they stay in the endoplasmic particular? How come they don't go... By diffusion, anyway, they can go right into the COP2 vesicle. And the answer is, part of it is that they're in big complexes that don't diffuse very well. They're in complexes. They're not just floating around. And some of that work was actually done in Dr. Privish's lab to show that these proteins are in these big complexes. The other, but it still sometimes gets out. They still sometimes manage to get into the COP2 vesicles, and that would be very wasteful for the cell. How do they, how does the cell deal with that? Well, when those proteins get into the, say it's a membrane protein, a member of the oligosaccharide complex, for example, it gets, if it gets transported from the cis Golgi network, guess what? That's a trans, transmembrane proteins, right? Those transmembrane proteins have signals just like the receptors do. They have these Dive these basic signals, which interact with COP1. So if they happen to get into the uh, 
if transported by the COP2 vesicle, they can be transported back by the COP1. So there's a mechanism for kind of correcting any mistakes. What about BIP and other chaperones? They sometimes get transported by accident out of the ER, and they can arrive at the cis network. And there's another protein, a membrane protein, called the KDEL receptor that is there in the cis network. All of the proteins that are chaperones have a sequence, KDEL, at their C terminus, that four amino acid code, at their C terminus. Whenever they get to the cis network, they bound to this protein, which also cycles back and forth, except that now it cycles with the KDEL, with the BIP, I'm sorry, into the COP1 vesicles, taking the BIP back to the ER, right, and then it gets back into the COP2 vesicle without any cargo, and so it has sort of the opposite cycle. So these are the error correction mechanisms that are built into these forward and reverse pathways that mediate the E articles and traffic. Is there any questions about that? Yes. Um, do, is KDEL uh, part of the protein? Or yes, it's it is. the last four amino acids of the protein. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm a little confused as to what the, the blue duck thing does if it's just going to the, the Golgi network and then being transported back into the ER. This, this, yeah. is, this is BIP. BIP is a chaperone. It should be in the ER, right? So sometimes it leaks out into the vesicle, gets to the Cisgolgi network, is brought back by a receptor, this is how one does. So that doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose in that cycle? Not in the cycle, only in the ER. It's folding proteins in the ER. It needs to be there. Okay? Mistakenly goes there. Yes. What enzyme? Well, again, you don't need an enzyme in this case um, because there's a slow activity of the ARF1 or the SAR1, and when they start hydrolyzing the GPP, the GPP code falls off. It's, it's sort of a regulated, it's a regulated process. There are other proteins, but just a simple, simple story. It slowly hydrolyzes the GPP itself. Yeah. So when the KDL gets back to the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, it's a bit. With the KDEL. Right. Well, what happens? What keeps it from picking it up again and just taking it since it's that? Well, again, it, it likes the, the different ionic environment.